Okay, let's see. Okay, it's recording. Okay, so today we'll be going over the patterns of inheritance. So patterns of inheritance. So that deals with heredity and the genetics is a term that just refers to the study of it. And there was a man named uh, Johann Gregor Mendel who basically set the framework for genetics before the chromosomes the genes have been identified. So he didn't understand what genes were, yet still he managed to come up with this theory. So Mendel selected a simple biological system, piece, and uh, conducted methodical and quantitative analyses using a large sample size. And because of Mendel's work, we now know that the genes on chromosomes are the basic fundamental units of heredity with the ability, ability to be replicated, expressed, or mutated. And genes are inherited in either Mendelian or non-Mendelian fashion. So his experiments, um, he was a life, lifelong learner, teacher, scientist, and man of faith. Uh, he was a monk in Abbey in uh, Czech Republic. In 1856, he began research into pea plants and reported the results from 30,000 pea plants in 1865 and published the experiments in pea hybridization in 1866. And he demonstrated that the traits are transmitted from parents to offspring in specific patterns. His work went unnoticed until some scientists believed that inheritance involved some blending of parental traits into in intermediate appearance of in the offsprings. And this result at the time was a result of, with this assumption, it was a result of continuous variation, uh, belief in continuous variation, or the range that small differences among individuals in traits like height. Um, so Mendel chose to chose the idea of discontinuous variation where individuals showed distinguishable traits. So like either violet or white flowers, but not pink, for instance. Um, and that, that choice allowed him to see that the traits were not blended, but they were inherited as distinct traits. And in 1900, his work was rediscovered before discovering the chromosomal inheritance. So what did he do? He used garden peas, uh, pisum sativum, to study the inheritance. Why did he do that? Because peas naturally self-fertilize, and pollen, uh, that is, pollen encounters the ova within the same flower, which has both male and female reproductive organs and makes both uh, gametes. And the garden peas are true breeding and inbred, true breeding inbred pl plants because the petals are tightly sealed until the pollination. And peas always produced offsprings that look exactly like the parents, which means what, which is what true breeding means. So for instance, if you true breeding, if you cross a true breeding uh, plants, purple and white, what would you expect to get? Garden and uh, garden piece also. Oh yeah, and garden piece also matured in one season, allowing the several generations to be observed in a short, uh, short time. And a large number of peas could be grown at the same time, allowing the uh, allowing Mendel to conclude the results were not random. So he did the hybridization or crosses by mating two true breeding plants with different traits. He basically manually transferred the pollen from anther. Anther is here. This is stamen. Anther is right there. To the stigma, which is right here, or shown here. So basically, it's going from here to there. And if it's self fertilizing, so you have to take the pollens from one plant to and then uh, put it on the stamen or a stigma, excuse me, of another plant. So if you were to take the true breeding violet and true breeding uh, white flowers 
then you get all violet flowers. That's kind of strange. So in P generation or parental generation, um, you grow the seeds from the parental, parental cross and the offsprings are called the F1s. And this is the F1 here, all purple flowers or all violet flowers. And examine the traits of the F1 generation and allow them to self-fertilize naturally to generate the filial two or second generation. So these flowers are getting self-fertilized, or this P flower is getting self-fertilized. And once you do that, you get these strange ratios. You get the purple, and you get the white. And then he extended to F3, F4, and so on. And basically, ratios of traits in P1, F2, F1, and F2 is what formed the basis of Mendel's theory. So... In 1865, Mendel reported the results of his crosses involving seven characteristics, seed texture or seed shapes, seed color, flower color, pea pod size or shape, pea pod color, plant height, and flower position. And each of those traits have two contrasting uh, traits. Each of those um, characteristics, rather, have two contrasting traits. So either round versus wrinkle texture, yellow versus green seeds, and so on. And the trait is defined as a variation of in the physical appearance of heritable tra uh, characteristics. And Mendel generated large number of F1 and F2 and repro reported the results from F2. First, he confirmed that the plants bred true, meaning regardless of uh, uh, bred true for the color, regardless of number generations. That's what true breeding means. Meaning if you bred purple with purple, you always get purple in all generations. And all self-crossed offsprings of uh, purple flowers had purple flowers. Same thing for the white flowers. And plants otherwise were uh, identical for seven, the other six characteristics. And this was important as a control because uh, this was a key in understanding alleles and genes. And he was lucky enough to choose the traits and characteristic where one gene was solely responsible for one characteristic in the mental system. He got lucky in that. So he took otherwise identical uh, true braiding plants, purple and white, again. He brushed the pollen from purple flower on the stigma of, of white flower and let this plant produce the peas. Then he planted the peas again. This is the uh, F1 hybrids now. And 100% of F1 hybrids had purple flowers. And if continuous variation was indeed the mechanism, what would you expect? Purple mixed with white should produce something like pink-ish color. Except Mendel showed that white flower trait disappeared in the F1 trait, F1 generations, excuse me. Uh, Mendel then allowed the F1 plants to self-fertilize. These are the F1s self being self-fertilized here. And produced the filial two or second generation plants and the 705 plants in F2 had put purple flowers and 224 had white flowers by about ratios of 3.15 to one, approximately three to one. Mendel then tested if there's a difference in inheritance, inheritance of traits carried in the pollen versus the ovum. So he took the, instead of uh, taking the pollen from the purple flower, he took the pollen from white flowers and did the same thing. And he approximately observed same ratios irrespective of which gamete contrib contributed which gam uh, trait. And that was called the uh, uh, reciprocal cross. It's the reciprocal cross is cross where the traits of the male and the female in one cross become the respective traits of female 
and male in the other cross. In other words, pollen from white flower, uh, pollen from purple flower on the ova versus pollen from white flower on the ova and vice versa. So all of six other characteristics show the same pattern in F1 and F2. One of two traits would disappear in F1 generation and the disappeared trait would reappear in F2 in the ratios of three, three to one. And after thousands of plans, Mendel concluded that characteristics could be divided into expressed, he named it, or latent traits. We call these dominant versus recessive these days. So the dominant traits are the inher inherited unchanged in the hybrid hybridization. In other words, uh, purple flower in this case is the dominant trait. Recessive trait disappears in the offspring in the hybridization experiment or F1, but reappears in the progeny of the hybrids or F2. And that was the white flower. Reappearing recessive trait means the traits are not blended, but remain separate. So Mendel proposed uh, the plants possessed two copies for the traits for the flower color uh, characteristic. And each parent transmitted one of their two copies to the offspring where they came together. And the physical observation of the dominant trait could mean that organism had two versions of the traits, two dominant, two, or two, uh, or two, two, dom yeah, two dominant or one dominant and one recessive. In other words, two dominant, having the uh, two dominant characteristics would be nowadays called homozygous dominant and one dominant and one recessive would be heterozygous dominant. And this observation that the recessive trait uh, meant that organisms lacked any dominant version of this characteristic, or in purple and white example, white flowers. So the seven characteristics that uh, Mendel evaluated were expressed as one of the two traits. And Mendel deduced that the plant had two copies of the characteristic that are passed to the offsprings. And now we call those copies of characteristics these days, genes. And there are two because they're on homolog chromosomes from our moms and dads. And in meiosis, remember, the homologs separate in the metaphase one. And it's the separation of the homolog means that only one of the genes that gets into the gamete. And these genes have variants, alleles. How do these arise? These arise because chromosomes, remember, remember chromosomes at the metaplate line up precisely. If this is mom and if this is dad, the genes on it line up precisely. And these gene, copies of these genes on these separate chromosomes are what we call alleles. And because they're different, they're they're from our mom and our dad, and because they're different people, they have differences in sequences. So the dominant allele purple is the uh, recessive, then must be white. So Mendel exa examined inheritance, inheritance of two alleles, but some genes have more than two alleles. Remember, blood types, remember, are codominant. Um, so the two alleles for the gene in a diploid organisms are expressed and interact to produce a physical characteristics. We call this phenotype. Phenotype is the observable trait expressed by an organism, uh, colors, and the genotype is the organism's genetic makeup, consist consisting of both visible and invisible alleles, or dominant or recessive. Okay. And the true breeding yellow and true breeding green seeds uh, yields all yellow F1s. And now you should know that the yellow then must be the dominant. We know that green trait is not lost because re it reappears in F2. So here's yellow, here's green, 
F1, all yellow, but F2, green reappears in ratios of three to one. And so then F1 is no longer true breeding and F1 must be different somehow from the parent uh, generation plants. So Mendel's, uh, and Mendel's plants happened to be homozygous for the traits that he was studying because they were all true breeding. And the homozygous diploid has two identical alleles on the homologs at the same location, remember? And the genotype, big Y, big Y, or little y, little y, represents the two alleles in the genotype. Cap typically, caps typically represent the dominant, lowercase recessive. And typically letters are used to denote you know, the dominant trait. So if it's a yellow P, letter Y is used. And F1 yellow Ps are obviously heterozygotes, big Y, little y. In all, uh, and the law of dominance, uh, Mendel proposed few laws. In all seven characteristics, one of the two traits is dominant. He calls this expressed unit vector. We call it dominant. Uh, recessive is the, he called it latent unit vector. So the Mendel's law of dominance states that in a heterozygote, one trait will conceal the presence of another trait, which is exactly what dominant does to the recessive alleles. So example, purple flower again, and the yellow seeds in F1 generation are heterozygotes and their dominant traits are showing through, hiding the white flower and hiding the green seeds. Here, uh, a child is shown here. Uh, she, had, he, she, child, baby, has albinism. It's called the ocular cutaneous albinism. And this trait is recessive. So you know immediately if this is the child's mother, this chi child's mother must have been the carrier or this must, child must have been the, if these are the two parents, they must be heterozygous for that uh, recessive trait. So uh, monohybrid cross, uh, this refers to the cross between two true breeding parents that differ only in the characteristic being studied, one single characteristic. And the monohybrids are the offsprings of that cross. And Mendel has seven types of monohybrid crosses, each for contrasting characteristic or con contrasting traits for the seven characteristics. And all F1 phenotypes had one of the parents, parents' uh, traits. Traits in this. Which one is showing up? Obviously, dominant is showing up. But F2 always revealed the recessive in three to one ratios. So he postulated that each parent in the cross contribute, contributed one of two paired unit factor to each spring, offspring. And every possible combination of unit factors were equally likely then he used probability or likelihoods. Uh, probability of one, this means that guaranteed to occur. Prob probability of zero, it's guaranteed to not occur. Probability of 0.5 means it has equal chance of occurring or not occurring. Uh, true breeding yellow seeds crossed with green uh, is shown in this monohybrid cross here. And we'll go over how to do this Punnett square soon. Dominant is denoted as big Y, big Y. Recessive, little Y, little Y. These are the parental uh, genotypes. And then all possible combination of the parental alleles are listed along the top and the side. Well, that's, I'm getting ahead of myself here. These are the possible gametes from uh, yellow, true breeding parent. This is the possible gamete from true breeding green steed. But F1 is a heterozygote. So they, it can produce two types of gametes. 
So if you were to self-cross this F1 generation, then we need to do the Punnett square. And on the top is the gamut from one parent. And on the side are the gametes from number two parent. And then you just combine the alleles in a grid. And each box represent fertilized zygote, separate zygote with diploid genotype. And each box is equally likely or they all have the same probability of occurring. And this now allows us to calculate the progeny ratios in F1 self-cross. Each parent has, has the same probability of giving either big Y or little y to the F2 progeny. And that this is the uh, reason why one in four chance of both parents giving the big Y to the progeny. And this is also why there are one in four, uh, there are two heterozygotes, but by two different pathways, there's one in four chance that parent A giving the big Y, or ch one is same chance in parent B giving the big Y, and the other pa uh, parent giving the recessive small Ys. And then obviously there's the one in four chance that both parents giving the little Y. So each parent has an one in four chance of giving Y, which leads to big Y, big Y, F2, which is the homozygous uh, dominant. And each parent also has one in four chance of giving little Y, little Y, recessive homozygous. And then there are two pathways to producing big Y, little Y progeny. So if you count the colors in F2, you get three yellows and one green, three to one ratio. And he used this math model to predict the outcomes in the cross. And then he also proposed this law of segregation. And uh, he postulated that the pair of pair unifactors or genes must segregate equally into gametes such that the offsprings have equal likelihood of inher inheriting either factors. In F2 generation, the possible genotypes are homozygous, dominant, heterozygous, big Y, little Y, little Y, big Y, uh, or homozygous, recessive. And the heterozygotes arise as a result of two parent pathways, as we have shown. And the heterozygotes and the dominant, homo uh, uh, dominant homozygote have the same phenotype, that is, same color. And this explains the three to one ratio. And equal segregation stems from uh, <clears throat> well, uh, each gametes are allowed to, or each gametes are equal and they segregate equally, and which allows the punish scores to be used. And the basis of the equal segregation is the metaphase one of the meiosis. Mendel didn't know about this because meiosis is when you separate the homologs inherited from mom and dad, and they can line up differently. And uh, with mom on the left and dad on the right, or mom on dad on the left or mom on the right. So on and so forth. Red on the left, blue on the right, or blue on the left, red on the right. And the homologs have the alleles big A and the little a, and these have equal chance of making it into the gamete cell. So Mendel developed a way to determine if an organism that expressed the dominant trait was heterozygote or homozygote. And this is the uh, what test cross is. In the test cross, the, the dominant phenotype is crossed with known homozygous recessive. Then what would you expect? In other words, your first parent is either big Y, big Y, or big Y, little Y, 
and that's being crossed with little i, little i. If it's homozygous nominate, all filial generation will lead to one phenotype that is of the dominant phenotype. If it's heterozygous, half of them will be dominant, the other half will be recessive. So here's an example of test cross. Uh, you you cross it with little y, little y, and you ended up getting all yellow seeds. Then you know that all of these uh, all of these progenies are heterozygous, which means the parent obviously was homozygous dominant. And if this cross yields uh, half yellow and half green, then you know the parent had the little y. Otherwise, it, the, otherwise these progenies are not possible. So you have a pea plant with a dominant phenotype in color. It's yellow. And you want to find out if it's homozygous dominant or heterozygous. You do the test cross with homozygous recessive, which is green. What would you expect? Which is what's shown here. In this case, you get all, you get all yellow seeds, yellow peas. But if you were to get half yellow seeds and half green seeds, then you know the parental genotype was heterozygous. And he also proposed this law of independent assortment. It just means that, uh, again, we're going back to the meiosis uh, idea. It's the idea that genes do not influence each other in sorting alleles into gametes or how it enters into the gamete. And all possible combination of alleles for all genes are equally likely, likely to occur. And this again results from homologs or chromosome from mom and dad lining up at the meta plate randomly. You can have mom's chromosome A on the left or dad's chromosome A on the left or vice versa. And each of these homolog combination, A and B, will separate into uh, different gametes. Here's blue, blue, red, red, but this particular example has blue on the left, red on the right, but red small chromosome on the left, blue small chromosome on the on the right. And if you look at it, these gametes are different from these gametes, which only has this one only has blue chromosomes, this one only has white, uh, red chromosomes. But this one has big white, big blue, little red, big red, and little blue. So there are four different types of gametes stemming from two chromosomes alone. Uh, in the lab, you did a two pairs of chromosomes uh, for the meiosis. Why is that? Because independent assortment can only be shown by doing the tie hybrid cross. And the dihybrid cross uh, uh, deals with two characteristics or four different traits. So seed color and the texture will be example, wrinkled green, round yellow. Wrinkled green is homozygous recessive. Round yellow is homozygous dominant. Parents are homozygous here because they are true breeding. And the law of segregation uh, dictates that gametes only get one allele, one of the traits. And the wrinkle green gametes are all little y, little r, little y. Round yellow gametes are, gametes are all big y, big r, little y. Or big y, I'm sorry, big r, big y. And then F1 generation must be heterozygous or big r, little r. Big Y, little Y. So then 
F1 gametes must have one allele from each of the two genes. Big Y, little y, big R, little r. I.e., example, gamete, a gamete with big Y allele can either get big R or little r. It cannot have two big Y or two big R alleles because it has to segregate. It has to separate. Homologs have separated. And the gamete with a little r allele is equally like to get, uh, again, big Y or little y allele. Then you uh, do the dihybrid cross. It's upon a square with four equally likely gametes from big Y, little y, big R, little r heterozygotes is being self-crossed here. So you write down all possible gametes from uh, uh, this genotype. So those are big, R, big Y, little, big Y, big R, little Y, big R, big Y, little R, little Y, little R. And you then, um, I should go over what FOIL is, but I didn't make, I sh you should probably know what uh, FOIL, first, outside, inside, last. That's what FOIL is. So first allele, outside allele, inside allele, last allele. This is what generates these combinations, or there's one way to figure out how to generate the uh, gametes. And then you arrange them and on the top and the left of the Punnett square, which yields 16 equally likely genotype combinations. And when you do that, you get the ratios of nine, round yellow, three, round green, three, wrinkle yellow, one, wrinkle green. And Mendel's ideas on inheritance followed a simple pattern of dominant and recessive allele for single characteristics. So he basically showed that two units or alleles uh, are present for a gene and the alleles maintain their integrity in his case. But there are some, uh, okay, that's not important. Okay, recessive allele is hidden. And on other important modes of inheritance that do not follow the dominant recessive single gene models are things like incomplete dominance. Mendel was lucky enough to choose true breeding uh, plants that didn't blend the traits. And blending of the traits occur when you have incomplete dominance or sometimes even uh, uh, co-dominance. And you can have sometimes more than multi, uh, more than two alleles, and the linked genes violate the law of independent sorbent. Linked genes do not follow because they're uh, too close to each other. And epistasis, which is uh, hiding a, a trait or a characteristic that arise from uh, interaction of genes, basically. So, incomplete, incomplete dominance, the heterozygotes appear to be somewhat intermediate between the two parents. And the snapdragon plant shown here is a cross between homozygote white and homozygote red flower. And that will make offspring with pink flowers, which is somewhat pink here. And in other words, red is incompletely dominant to the white. What are some of the genotypes for this dihybrid cross? What would you expect? You would expect these are the uh, genotypes that are possible. And you will get one white, two pink, 
in one rig. And the variation on the incomplete dominance is called the codominance. This is where both alleles for the same characteristic is are expressed in the heterozygote, meaning they're both dominant. Uh, example is ABO blood group. A and B antigens are both on the cell surface. Then what is your genotype? Your blood genotype is AB. So you also get, if you were to cross AB with another AB, you also get one to two to one homozyg uh, uh, ratios, homozygous, heterozygous to another homozygous. <clears throat> and you can also have multiple alleles that violate uh, Mendel's laws. And individual humans may only have two alleles, Burkina genes, but multiple alleles may exist at the population level. And many uh, combinations of multiple, multiple alleles have been observed in the past. And typically we note the wild type with plus sign and all the other uh, phenotypes or genotypes are considered variants or the mutants of this typical form. And the variant may be either recessive or dominant to the wild type. And blood type ABO is again an uh, example. There are four blood types using three alleles and six genotypes. Here's big A, big A, that's blood type A, big A, O, that's blood type A, AB, that's blood type AB. BB is blood type B, BO, blood type B, O, blood type O. And so A antigen on uh, RBC, IB, no antigen. If you have no antigen, that's how you get blood type zero, blood type O rather. So if you were to do the cross uh, to determine multiple alleles, Parents have two alleles, but the population of three alleles. So you need three rows and columns for the Punnett square. A, B, and O. A, B, and O. And this allows us to figure out all possible combinations of genotypes in a population. But individuals only get two alleles despite there, that there being three alleles in the population. Uh, also, multiple drug resistance population in this gene in malaria parasite during haploid stage, haploid stage. And this only allows, allows the parasite to develop resistance easier because you need only you need mutations in only one of the multiple alleles for the drug resistance. And that's how you can actually get uh, uh, resistance faster. And we should talk about the sex linked traits. X has about, uh, we said 900 genes, and Y has about 55 genes. X is about three times longer, though. And uh, so X linked traits are more common, but Y linked traits also exist. So eye color in Drosophila is, was the first X linked trait that was discovered. And the Y type eye color is X. Big W, big Y, or big, yeah, is dominant to white, little Y, little W. And we say males are hemizygous, only has one of the alleles because we only have, we have X and Y. So in respect to X linked traits, we are hemizygous. So that also applies to Drosophila. So fly males are hemizygous for the eye color gene. And they will express whatever the trait the, the 
their X chromosome carry. So in a uh, in an X-linked cross, genotypes of F1 and F2 depends on the recessive trait being in the male or the female in the parental generation. If here's a male who's expressing red eye, and here's a male, here's a female expressing homozygous uh, trait or little w, little w, white eyed. If you were to cross that, what would you expect? Female gametes are uh, big W, little w, but male gametes are X and big W and Y. But Y males, males with XY uh, uh, genotype, hemizygous, must receive their X chromosome from the females. But the females have homozygous recessive traits. So in this cross, all males, only males, will express the recessive trait. And all females, conversely, will ex express uh, the dominant trait as a heterozygote. So big W, little w, big W from dad, little w from mom. So the homozygote female parents with recessive X-linked trait will pass the trait to 100% of their male offsprings. Some color blindness, hemophilia, muscular dystrophy, male pattern baldness, you should observe the mother's father for hints. Why would that be? Because the mother gets one of her exes from her father. And if father is is bald, and uh, that means mother is the carrier. <laughs> Heterozygous females are called the carriers, and they don't uh, show any phenotypes. And the carriers will pass the trait to half of their male progenies, and pass the carrier status to half of their female progenies. You know, there was carrier heterozygote females. Okay. In humans, males have non-homologous sex chromosomes because we have X and Y. In birds, females have the non-homologous pair. So female birds are hemizygous for sex length traits. So the ratio will be opposite of what we're seeing here in birds. So, like I said, linked genes violate the law of independent assortment. Some traits are not inherited independently of each other because they are located on the separate, or genes that are located on the separate non-homologous uh, chromosome will always sort independently. They're not linked. But if genes are close to each other on the same chromosomes are considered linked, and what happens in the prophase of uh, meiosis? You can have crossovers and you produce recombinant chromosomes, chromatids. And the chromosomes can make the same uh, genes and the same chromosome behave uh, like uh, they're, they're not linked. So recombination, crossover or crossover mix Mixes the uh, paternal and maternal genes, and the order, but the order of the genes are not uh, altered. What can change the order, like we talked about last time? Inversions or translocations, which are the uh, chromosomal disorders. There can be more than one recombination on one uh, chromosome. So this can occur multiple times. So, um, die hybrid, no, self cross of big T, little T, big R, little R, tall red heterozygotes shows the typical ratios of nine to three to three to one. See independent 
a servant that allows this. Uh, alleles separate independently of each other. Uh, but now imagine if the parental genes, big T, big R, are all located on the same chromosome. They cannot separate from each other except by crossing over. If the big T, little t, big R, little r, heterozygote is the parent, it can only contribute big T, big R, little r, little t, little r, but it cannot produce big T, little r, unless it's recombined. And that's being shown here, down here. Here's big R, big T, big R, little t, little r, and that's getting crossed. So if you look at it, all possible gametes from these two parent, uh, these two parents, are shown here: big T, big R, little T, little R. But if the crossover to to crossover were to occur, then you produce these recombinant chromosomes, chromatids, with recombined possibilities. And uh, this is showing, this cross is showing the uh, conventional independently assorting uh, hyper cross. So let's go over that again. Blue from mom, red from dad. Each sister chromatids will be the gametes. Without the crossover, there'll be two big T, big R. Two little t, little r. With crossover, you get the very combination or type of uh, type you get with the independent assortment, even though they're linked, because you have the crossover. And the genes for the tall red color are on the same chromosome and cannot independently assort. Yet with the crossover, they can seem kind of assorting independently. Uh, so some people in the history have suggested that Mendel initially chose the seven characters for this very reason, because this really messes up the ratios and it really becomes really difficult to make sense of the ratios. And then there's also the epistasis Mendel's studies in peas show that the phenotypes completely are controlled by the single gene or the unit vectors. And he also may have chosen them for, for, the, for that reason. And this, these seven are not the rule, but they're the exceptions. Almost all characteristics that we have are controlled by multiple, multiple genes. For instance, eye color is controlled by eight genes, as far as we can tell. So in development, genes are ex expressed sequentially without protein-protein interaction. And the uh, skin color is a result of three or more genes. And these are called the polygenic inheritance, because the one single trait depends on many, many genes. And genes also may interact with each other to activate or inhibit. And the epistasis refers to that scenario. So one gene uh, can activate or inhibit the other gene, then the, the other gene is either turned on or turned off and has nothing to do with dominance or resistance. And hypostatic allele, is the allele that is masked by this epistatic uh, allele between the masking, or is the gene that gets inactivated. And often biochemical basis for the epistasis is a gene pathway in which the expression of one gene depends on the function of a gene that precedes it in the pathway. So agouti, uh, uh, wild-type coat color in mice, 
agouti, big A, big A, is dominant to solid colors. And, but there's a separate gene C when present as a recessive homozygote, little c to little c, negates expression of any pigment from the big A gene or agouti color gene. So if homozygote is present, little c to little c, then what would you expect? To a dihybrid cross of heterozygote agouti mice, what would you expect? So big A, little c, big A, little a, big C, little c. These are heterozygotes. If little c, little c negates the pigment production, even if dominant big A allele is present as either homozygote uh, big A or heterozygote big A, little a, color cannot be expressed. In other words, all little c, little c mice are albinos. So typically you would expect nine to three to three to one, but there are four uh, little c's possible. There are two of these. So you get the ratios of nine to three to four albinos. So here's homozygous recessive, Heterozygous recessive. And it's ho homozygous dominant for the Oguri gene, but they're all albinos. In other words, C gene is epistatic to A, or A gene is hypostatic to C gene. Okay, um, let's see if I want to. You know what, let's, let's leave it there. Okay, that's all for today.